morning. Good morning. Good morning. There, that works. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at First United Methodist Church of Sanford. My name is David. One of the pastors here, we are delighted to have you here with us, whether you're in person in our sanctuary or whether you are joining us online. We are excited that you are here with us and hope, we, uh, uh, hope you feel warm and welcome. Warm, mm, it's fall, technically, um, but yeah, you get what I'm saying. Um, I want to turn your attention to the bulletin. We've got a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention. The first is a very heartfelt thank you uh, to those of you who came out and helped with our co-op cleanup yesterday. Uh, friends, we were small but mighty. All of the rooms in the upstairs portion of that, uh, the Fellowship Hall building are clean uh, and empty, uh, which is kind of a feat to be had. Um, I would invite you, this is a great time, if you've never seen that space, to go now uh, to see it, uh, to see what is and maybe not what was. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, we, uh, we've transformed the second building in our, on our campus to a cooperative space with dedicated and shared space use partners. We've got nonprofits and folks who are doing amazing things in the city and the community uh, that are, we are just thrilled and honored and privileged to be a part of and in partnership with. So if you don't know much about the co-op, this is a great opportunity to learn. Uh, Pastor Megan or myself would love to, to talk your ear off about what it is that's going on there. And there's plenty of other folks that are passionate and excited. But thank you for the uh, strong backs and uh, folks who came out and, uh, and helped uh, move those things. And we've really, it's an amazing, amazing thing to do and to see. I um, want to invite you after service today to a, we're having a branding issue. It's not a baby shower. Uh, it's just a party. It's a baby party. Um, but everyone is invited. It's a baby party to celebrate baby Kohler and to celebrate Bobby and Dusty and their new adventure of parenthood. Um, we've had some, some hardworking angels getting that space ready, uh, and we're excited to celebrate uh, these two and, and the newest addition to our church family. So we hope you'll join us immediately after service in McKinley Hall for a party. We also, uh, I want to point your attention to this insert in the bulletin, the Eat Well, Live Well series sponsored by the Picnic Project. Uh, this is a cooking class uh, that um, seems really cool. Uh, if you know Mark and you know the work of the Picnic Project, you know this is something that might be interested. So you've got some information there. If that's something that would be interesting to you, uh, make sure you, you follow up on that uh, October the 3rd at uh, 11 a.m. And I want to uh, invite you next week to join us for World Communion Sunday. The first Sunday in October is always when we celebrate World Communion Sunday, a, a, a symbol, uh, a, a recognition that the church is bigger than this one congregation uh, and that the work that God is doing is much bigger than just in this community. And we want to celebrate and worship with Christians around the world as we celebrate communion and, 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 and highlight what God is doing in our midst. So we want to invite you to that. This year we're partnering with uh, Allen Chapel AME. Uh, we hope to share some elements in worship, but, but more than that, we're trying to come up with collaborative ways to, to be in ministry, to be in fellowship with one another past World Communion Sunday. So hopefully we'll have some things to announce next Sunday with meals and shared gatherings with Allen Chapel. So stay tuned on that. And then am I good to walk now? Okay. Um, then finally, I want to bring your attention to these two quilts. Uh, as, as you've not, if you've not been here, uh, you, you should know uh, that our prayer quilt ministry does some incredible, holy, uh, God-inspired work uh, to create these incredible gifts of tangible expressions of love that go out into our community to those who are hurting, to those who need a, a visible and, and tangible sign of love and comfort. And so we've got two quilts today. Uh, and our tradition is that after the service, if you want to come and lay hands on these quilts and say a prayer for the persons that they're going to, that way that we can guarantee that they're surrounded by love and God's spirit when, when they receive these gifts. The, gifts uh, the quilts that we have today, one is for Bob Foster. Uh, many of you know Bob and Gail uh, and, and their journey. And so we've, we've got a quilt for Bob and we, they wanted it extra big, right? They, well, and they want for the bed. Absolutely. This is for the bed. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Beautiful green quilt here. And then this little Afghan here is for baby Kohler. So 
come and lay your hands and say a prayer, say a blessing, uh, and surround these folks with love and comfort as we share these gifts of love in the community. Friends, I'm going to invite us to silence our hearts and our minds and to center our spirits in the presence of the living God as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Will you join me by reading the call to worship uh, in, the, in your bulletin? The Holy One, defender of the poor and needy, calls us to gather now. We come, thankful to be a part of this family of faith. God knows us well and calls us by name. We hear our name and respond to God's call. The love of Christ urges us on. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy God, by the power of your Spirit, open our hearts, minds, and ears. Let us see, hear, and feel what it is that you're doing in us, around us, and through us into this community, God. Show us the way that you are leading us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, dear ones. We're going to sing a new song. Now, it may not be new to you, but it's certainly new to me. Number 60 in our hymnals. If you're not familiar with it and choose not to sing, make sure you pay attention to these wonderful words. Stand if you're able, and we'll sing all four verses. We'll invite you now to turn to number 882 and share together the Apostles' Creed. 882. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Number 71. Glory. invite you now to turn and say hey to your neighbor. Hey neighbor, you know they're going to do that. <laughs> Just what she said. Okay. Well, you know, if Lynn would sit down, we'd be okay. Our Old Testament lesson today Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manassas, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite of Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land. 
and by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Thus ends the Old Testament reading. Children forward for a children's moment. Good morning. morning. Well, now I feel like I have, need to match my kids. This is, uh, <laughs> I feel out of place. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Do you want to know what one of my favorite things in the whole world is? <gasps> you don't. No, <laughs> no one wants to know. <laughs> what a burger? Close, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Do you know what one of my favorite things in the whole world is? What? A big ice cream cone. Who likes ice cream cones, right? I tell you what, an ice cream cone on a hot summer day is one of the greatest gifts that God has given humanity, I believe. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, oftentimes it's, it's one of those moments like if I'm at the beach all day and then I'm like really hot, maybe sunburnt, and I go to the ice cream shop and I get an ice cream with my family or my friends and it's just that perfect moment. Maybe the sun is setting, and I want that moment to last forever. And maybe I'm thinking, gosh, I can't wait till the next moment that I get an ice cream cone. Or, hey, remember that last time that we had ice cream cones together? And, and, and I just might think that I, I want that moment to never end. And maybe I just want to sit there and take it all in forever. Well, what would happen if I sat there and took that moment in for three or five minutes? What would happen? It would melt. It would melt. My ice cream cone would melt. Yes, my favorite part about ice cream cones are that they are delicious and they are wonderful. My least favorite part about ice cream cones is that they melt, especially in the Florida heat. You take them out of the freezer and they're delicious and cold, but then they start to drip down your fingers and then you've got, you know, sticky hands for the rest of the day. It's hard because there's only a limited amount of time that we have with that ice cream cone. And so we can spend it thinking about what's next or what, you know, the most amazing time we've ever had with ice cream cones, but if we don't pay attention to what's in our hands right there, we're going to miss it, and we're going to have sticky hands, and we're going to miss that opportunity to have a delicious treat. I think our lives are kind of similar to those ice cream cones, if you think about it, because there's plenty of folks that are thinking about the next thing. Gosh, I can't wait till I'm in middle school. I can't wait till I'm in high school. And there's also plenty of people thinking about the last thing. So some of you may be sitting here today thinking, I cannot wait until I'm in high school. That's going to be so awesome. And I bet you there's some folks behind me that are thinking, I wish I was in high school again, right? <laughs> People, we always kind of think about what was or what could be, and, and, and often we miss what's right in our hands. It's delicious, amazing opportunity that's right in our hands. And so, you know, we don't have forever with ice cream cones, and we don't want to make sure we make the best of it. And I think that God asked us to do the same with our lives. You guys have taught me some amazing things these last couple of weeks with the children's sermons, where each of you, um, which each of you taught. And one of the things that you taught me is that you don't have to wait for God to use you to be creative and show us how to love and show us how to care. Each of you is already doing that. You don't have to wait till you're a certain age to be smart or profound or faithful or know who God is and what God is doing. Each of you is showing us each and every day what God is like and how we can be more like God. So you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until you're an adult. You don't have to wait until you're 18. You don't have to wait until you're in middle school to do that. You're already doing that. So like that ice cream cone, we need to take care to pay attention to what we have right now and to enjoy it and to take it all in and to see the goodness and the beauty of God, okay? I think this is an excuse to ask your parents for ice cream later, okay? <laughs> I, I think we did it, right, okay? So you can blame me, all right? All right, that's fine. Can we pray together? Holy God, we give you thanks for the wisdom, for the beauty, for the heart, for the minds, and for the spirits of these children. God, we are so grateful. We are so privileged. We are so blessed to have them in our midst. God, let us not miss it. Let us take it all in, right? Look at what is in our hands, God. Take it right in what's right in front of us, oh God. Lord, inspire us by your spirit to live lives each and every moment, each and every day, that show the world your love and your grace and your mercy. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.
We now have the opportunity to pray together for one another, for our world, for this church, for this community. Um, in your bulletin, you'll see uh, a prayer request list. These are folks who have asked us to pray for them, and so they have trusted us to hold them in prayer, and so we take that really seriously. As we pray, I'll share a category, and you can feel free to share your prayer, uh, the, the person on your heart, aloud or silently, and we'll close each section with, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you today as an act of trust, an act of faith. Lord, we are here because we are looking for you. God, we are asking, we are seeking, we are knocking, and we are trusting that you hear us when we call. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. And so we lay these cares and concerns at your feet because we know that you love these folks more than we ever even could. God, we lift up to you prayers for all those who are seeking healing, for those grieving, for those seeking a, a way forward in their physical health diagnosis, for those who are mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or physically ill, for those who are trying to figure out what their treatment might be, and for all the healing that we know is necessary in our world, Lord, we lift up these prayers for healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we pray for all those who are seeking wisdom and discernment. For everybody who is calling out to you, trying to figure out their next step in life. For those who can't see a way forward and who are looking for the light of your day. For all those who have big decisions to make, big leadership, sho leadership shoes to fill, and for all of us, who need a glimpse of your wisdom, we lift up these prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for all those who are lonely, for those who are searching for connection in some way or another, for those who are far from people they love, for everybody who works away from their families, those who are deployed, those who work overseas, for all those in our jails and prisons, for people in our nursing care facilities, for those in the foster care system and those who care for them, for all people who feel disconnected who feel lonely or who feel far from those they love, we lift up these prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for our enemies. We lift up those people who have done us harm or wished us harm. We lift up those people with whom we have deeply severed relationships. Not because it makes what they've done okay, not because our hurt was blessed by you, but because, Lord, you have asked us to pray for our enemies and because forgiveness is a gift for us too. Lord, we lift up to you prayers for all those we consider enemies and those who consider us their enemies as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we lift up to you prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude. When we look around at this world, we see so many glimpses of your goodness, of your kingdom, of your hope. 
God, we see signs of new life. We hear little voices. We are reminded that you are always up to a new thing. God, we pray for all that we have that we are grateful for, that we wouldn't take it for granted, Lord Jesus, but that as we hold it in our hands, we would see it as a gift by the power of your grace for ourselves and for others. We celebrate with you all these prayers of gratitude. For all the kids in our community, for the blessing in this church. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we lay at your feet these prayers because we trust you, and we ask, Lord, that you would not only hear, but you would act. Bring comfort to those who mourn. Bring healing to those who are afflicted. Bring restoration to those who are divided. And transform us, Lord Jesus, so that we can not only revel in the power of your love, but that love would overflow so much that it transforms our neighborhood and our community and our world. Lord, we ask that in all that we do, you would make us a blessing. And now let us pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our service of worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. God, we ask a blessing for these gifts. Let them be tangible signs in our community and in our world of hope, of love. God, bless these gifts and multiply them so that the world may know the goodness and the mercy of our God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The New Testament lesson today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. And Paul uses the plural at the end of this passage, but the reason for that is that as this is being written, he and Timothy are together, so he includes both of them uh, in the writing. 
Please hear the word of the Lord. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of God for the people of God. This week, we end our series, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. We are ending the poem as well. So I want us to start today just by hearing the last three pieces of the poem's words. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup? The roots go down and the plant goes up and nobody really knows how or why, but we are all like that. Number 15, goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they will all die. So will we. Number 16, and then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word that you learned, the biggest word of all, look. Don't miss it. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you because you are God and we are not. Lord Jesus, speak to us a word that you have for us this morning and help us when we hear it to say yes. Amen. All right, so in Deuteronomy today, we heard the story of the death of Moses, revered Israelite prophet and leader who orchestrated one of God's greatest miracles, freeing the enslaved Israelites from Egypt. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. You remember the story. He, he got to meet God in a burning bush and got to receive the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Moses and God had quite the journey together. A story so good that Disney borrowed it from us. And yet we are reminded today that even Moses has limits. Part the sea, change the world, make your life a billboard for God, and still we hear today that Moses comes to the end of his story. We are reminded today that we are beings with limits. We have limited time. We have limited capacities. We are only part of the story that God is telling. Now, I don't know about you, but I can feel it in the room right now, and you can probably feel it in the pews. We don't love limits as human beings, and we don't like talking about them either. We've been trying to be unlimited since Genesis. It's not new for us. We're not alone. This is like a thing people do. We love unlimited stuff particularly, I feel like, in our culture. Unlimited refills. My husband will not go to a restaurant if they don't have unlimited refills. <laughs> we love unlimited choices, right? If three cereal choices are great, then 3,000 must be better. In my case, an unlimited seafood buffet or unlimited cups of coffee. We can see this when we look around in a marketplace too, right? We see this little sneaky dream stepping its toes into our world. With this cream, we can look like we have never aged. With this health plan, you will feel like you are 25 forever. Now, I'm not dogging taking care of ourselves. Our bodies are God's temple, of course, and so we're not the only ones living in it. We want to take good care of it. But know that even the grandest plans are still bound by our limits in time and space. 
You see, the reality of death pushes us to ask two things. What happens next? And what do we do with the limited time that we have? <clears throat> we'll answer the first question first. I am a preacher, so lots of times folks think I have a, a secret. I have all the secrets of heaven, right? We go to seminary and they finally tell us like all the secrets that we keep to ourselves. That's not true. <clears throat> I do have a secret and here it is. I don't know what heaven is like. I don't know the intricacies of God's rubric for who's there, and honestly, I can't always make sense of what's metaphor and what's literal and the details of the afterlife in our scriptures. But here's what I do know. And y'all, this isn't a secret at all. God is good. And God is love. And any chance I have to be closer to that, I'm in. We know that God is the source of light and life, our ever-present help, our creator and our redeemer. That God knew every hair on your head and loves you more than you even knew could be possible. We know God is gracious beyond what we could imagine and God is just beyond what we could judge. We know God loves you and the people that you love more than the depths of your heart could contain. We know God loved us so much that Jesus didn't stay cozy in heaven away from the woes of this life. He traded in his righteousness and otherworldly existence to reach out to us on our best and especially on our worst days. We know that whatever glimpses of goodness and new life and hope and peace and wholeness that we have seen here don't have anything on the sheer beauty of whatever heaven's like. And we know that heaven isn't the special club for just the cool kids and those of us in religious robes. Heaven is for everyone who is running toward it in the shadow of the Lord. If I'm honest, there are a lot of folks we love who already know way more about heaven than we do, and thanks be to God for that. And what are we to do while we wait? Did you notice in Deuteronomy 34, that scripture that Carol read for us, the promised land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses got to glimpse it, and Joshua got to walk around. Each of them may only be part of the story, but aren't we glad that each of them walked with God and did what they were called to do? Y'all, none of them is the whole story, but all of them has an essential role to play in God's grand narrative. A popular TV series took up this question, and in my opinion, I think they got a lot of people thinking about afterlife and, and heaven, even though um, you might have just thought it was a, a, a silly comedy series. The Good Place premiered a few years ago and was written as a comedy, but they made the mistake of letting moral philosophers and theologians be on their writing staff. So you'd be like, wait a second, they just addressed like a huge moral question, but, but we laughed about it. <clears throat> now, there was a lot about the premise I may not be able to co-sign on, right? Like, where's God in the story? What kind of heaven could exist if we had to earn our way there? They kind of deal with that in the show. But they push the audience to ask really good questions and ultimately see that the limits of our life are what make it meaningful. For way too long, the Christian faith had some bad public PR and some bad theology, in my opinion. Somebody told lots of people of faith that it was only about what happens when you die. But you see, Jesus, you spend just a little bit of time with Jesus, and you figure out real quick he's not a, a sit-and-wait sort of guy. He's often a you-feed-them, get-up-and-walk, ask-seek-knock sort of dude instead. If our time is limited, that makes each moment even more important. 
What do we do with the limited time that we have? Don't waste it. Y'all, we are being invited today to remember, don't waste it for the love of all that is good and right and holy. Don't waste your precious, limited, meaningful life. God has important things for you to do, and we all need you to say yes. Could you imagine how the story might be different if God had called Moses and he was like, you know, no thanks, I don't want to upset anyone, especially Pharaoh's household, They're, they were kind of mad at me, and frankly, no one's going to believe me, so I'm just going to hang out here. Or think of the Hebrew midwives in, in Moses' story, Shifra and Puah. Those gals regularly delivered babies, and they knew that Pharaoh had demanded all the Hebrew baby boys be killed at delivery. And they saved Moses' life. And then Pharaoh's wife saved it again. Moses gets all the credit sometimes, but I am, I am on a vendetta that those gals are remembered as part of God's story too. So many contributions are woven together into the tapestry of the story that God is telling, and your life is part of it. Paul's letter to the Corinthians holds this sense of urgency today. You could hear. Now, he thought Jesus was coming back in a couple of decades, y'all. So, um, of course, he wrote with this sense of urgency, but we don't want to lose that. We aren't just waiting around for a new creation. Wherever people are being made new in Christ, the new creation is here. Individual people are being made new. Relationships are being made new. Communities are being made new. Our world can be made new. The message translation says it this way. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and we got it all wrong, as you know. We looked at the Messiah. Uh, we certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah has a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life emerges. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. As Christ's representatives, God uses us to persuade people to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. God's already friends with you. This is the extraordinary nature of our limited life. We can't totally know what's next, but we can practice now hearing the voice of God and saying yes. In our limited time and space, we can choose not to waste a single moment on the brokenness of violence and hatred and judging our neighbors. We can decide today that even though we can't do everything, we must do the things which we are called to do. Maybe it's scary. Maybe it's new. But we have to do it. We can practice now saying yes to friendship with Christ, a life with God, being part of the story that the Spirit is telling. I can't know what God is saying to each of you. Some of you actually probably hear better from the Lord than I do. I can't know the big dream that God has planted in your heart or the deep call that God has put on your life. I don't know the time that any of us has left or the reality of what comes next. I can't know where you feel like you stand with God, but I can tell you where God stands with you. God is calling each of us today to say yes. Yes to a life with Christ. Yes to being part of God's story. Yes to the hope of something beautiful. I know it's scary, the only marathon, the only whole marathon I've ever run is the one running away from a call to ministry. I got real good at that. 
But y'all, our yes is worth it. Don't waste your one limited, beautiful life. Say yes to the call of the Lord. Now, we don't do this around here often, but today I wanted to make space after the service for time at the altar. Because my guess is that in a room this big, there are lots of us that God is saying something to. Maybe for you, God's calling you to that big, crazy dream. Maybe God's calling you to a new vocation. Maybe God's calling you to reconciliation in a relationship that feels so difficult. Maybe God's calling you to say yes for the first time or the 300th time. Maybe God's calling you to something else. But today, I want us to be a place, a community of people who affirm that even when it's scary, our yes is worth it. Today, friends, we are invited to remember that our limits are a gift and that the God of love is always inviting us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. <clears throat> our closing hymn is number 707, a hymn of promise. Will you stand and we'll sing all three verses. As we close today, a reminder of the party afterward. I also want to let you know that we're going to make space at the altar. Feel free to come and pray for the quilts, but also if you are wanting to be anointed, it's an ancient practice of putting oil on your head and being marked for the journey ahead of you. If you want to be anointed for whatever it is God is asking you to say yes to today, we will be available at the altar. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Yes, yeah. yeah.